Now, our next um, guest that we're going to have on the on the line very shortly is Christchurch City Councillor Dion Swiggs. Um, I've watched the um, development of Dion's career with interest, especially since the earthquakes when he first came to um, to prominence. He formed a, an interest group uh, to try and fight on behalf of people who were getting nowhere with earthquake claims and and the like and battles with EQC. And he'll be joining us very shortly on the line. Here we go. Sorry about the wee delay there. Dion speaking. Oh, good evening, Dion. You're, you're live on air with Nick on After Dark. Um, how are you this evening? I'm great. How are you? I'm very good. You had an interesting afternoon today. You were out with the limited service volunteers. Yes, yeah, yeah. So earlier in the year, I was the uh, the patron for uh, Limited Service Volunteers, which is um, it's an army program we're in partnership with the Ministry of Social Development, young people um, who are looking for a next step in their life. And uh, yeah, it's been great to be a part of that and um, you know help help some of these young people steer into a better direction. I suppose. Did you um, do that course yourself as a young man? No, no. Although I did a leadership course. Um, I did a leadership course run under the same umbrella uh, when I was when I was about a little, I think I was eleven. Um, so yeah, I've, I've done a bit of stuff around that area and also been in the military myself. I suppose it has a bit of a, a unique um, touch for the young people. When the course was first developed, it, it seemed to me it might have been one of those kind of last chance boot camp type things. Is it has, has it moved on from that? Yeah, LSP. It, 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 for some people, definitely, it's this is that is still part of the program. So I mean, for some people, they are on a path that's probably not going to give them, you know, or, or push them forward in their own lives and actually really achieving stuff. And that's so. This is an intervention for some, um, and it's not really right. I wouldn't really call it boot camp. What I would call it is an educational kind of, um, you know, place. There is definitely a number of drill and discipline and all of that kind of stuff that you get from the military. Uh, but this is the, the LSV is, is more of an educational thing, and they take these people, they give them opportunities, they match people with their skills so that they can actually find out what they're actually good at, and then they can start to actually achieve stuff. Because a lot of these young people, they haven't achieved, or they haven't been told that they've achieved anything in their life. And sometimes just giving them some tasks, the right tools, and they see that they can actually do something will actually allow them to go away from um, or go back into their normal lives and actually do things positively and contribute positively to society. And if we can keep people out of the court system or off long-term benefits, I think that's a huge success for everybody. Do you have any idea of the number of um, graduates, if you like, or people who've gone through the course, how many of them actually sign up and, and join NZDF? There is an element of that. So, I mean, some, some of the young people that come through are looking for a taste of what the military is like. Uh, I know from um, there was three from the course that I, um, the first course of the year, that have now gone in and they've just graduated. I've been following their career. They've just graduated um, the first part of their basic training, which is so good. You know, they were so focused and they were thinking, yeah, military is what I want to do and I want to see if this is actually what I want to do. So it's an opportunity for, for them to go in. I, uh, I think from what I gather, it's it's only around 10%. Uh, so it's not a huge amount. Um, the the course, LSV specifically, is there to, to help people get to the next stage in their life or really show them that they can do stuff and actually achieve things and stop them from going down a path that maybe not where they want to be or where, you know, where they will end up not actually achieving some, some things in their life. How, you've um, spent a lot of time on, on the course and with being patron and, and visiting and supporting. Mm. How do you think the Army feel? Because they're the host training organisation at Burnham, and I think there are other centres throughout the country as well. How, how does the Army feel about it? About um, being part of it? Yeah. Yeah, well, they, 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 they're great. I mean, they want their patron. The, the patrons are there as a person that, 
the young people can look up to and aspire and and give them some uh, you know guidance and in, in ways that probably they can't do as staff. They're the ones that have got to discipline them and take them through all of the other bit. But as the patron, you're kind of a person outside that can give that extra little bit of a push and just maybe touch some of those those lives that is quite different. And the young people love it. And actually the staff love it as well because it gives them um, people who have made it in, in life and in a and been successful in coming back down to the grassroots level and doing these things for these young people. I think you know, it gives the staff a buzz as well. So it works for everybody. Um, some patrons can't put as much time in, um, but I was very keen. Um, my leadership style is very much, hey, let's let's um, let's let's get down and down into the trenches with with the, with the people, and and actually that's what I'd like, and that's what you know that's how I operated as a patron. You've um, actually spent some, um, I've seen the activity on Facebook, you've actually, they have a bit of a long march challenge, don't they, as um, part of the training. You've been on one recently. How was your fitness level? <laughs> the longest day. <laughs> you get up at 4am and you literally are doing activities all day. Now, um, my fitness levels are not the same as what they were when I was in the military. Um, <laughs> I will say that much. And uh, but it wasn't terrible. I mean, it was it was good. I mean, I I died just as just as much as all the rest of them died during the um, well, not physically died, but um, <laughs> got, you, you finish off one course, uh, one run, and you're down on the ground and you're trying to catch your breath, and everybody else is doing the same thing. So it's really good for the you know the young people to see that we are human as well. Um, people who are leaders and um, in in society are also human, uh, and I think that really helps um, you know with them. But yes, absolutely, I, I felt sore weeks after that longest day it was it was intense i mentioned in my um, introduction to you before you came to air that um you you come to prominence um during the earthquake period well as far as i was concerned can you tell us mm. about the the pressure group or the the interest group that you you formed yeah I, so after the after i left the navy um so after i finished school, I joined the Navy as, a, as an officer and I ended up being a warfare officer um, and navigation and just a, a generalist executive officer and, and when the earthquake happened I'd just left the military and I'd, I was down here in Christchurch and started a business and um, the earthquake happened and because of the experience that I had from my military time, especially the peacekeeping and also the, uh, the warfare stuff, I was able to kind of pick up on some of the things that I saw um, that were missing. And one of the big things was communication, and that's one of the big things that I, I I like to do, and I like to get messages out there, tell stories about what's actually happening. Uh, so I set up Rebuild Christchurch, which actually at the start was just about sharing the stories and sharing the information, uh, pulling together all of the different bits and bits of information and putting it into a digestible way of people to to take that in. Um, and then giving everybody the the ability to see how how that information fitted into uh, different ways. And I was very keen on technology at the time. It was kind of just the start of how websites were really being used to have proper conversations. Um, and I had a website developer um, business partner who helped build a, um, a a website that was actually um, targeted and evolved at the time uh, that was able to facilitate a lot of those conversations. But the real power of what we did um, came when I set up the Rebuild Christchurch Foundation, so the charity. There was a number of people that I could see just frustrated with what was going on. They couldn't, they were frustrated that they couldn't help and they saw that they needed help in many different areas around the city um, and that existing, existing frameworks weren't working. And so what we did is we set the charity up so that we could actually broker and bridge a lot of what was existing um, and because of the amount of need out there uh, to actually get things done. And that's where my sort of tag phrase that I that I did for elections was let's get it done. It actually started in 2011 when we set the Rebuild Christchurch Foundation up. And that's and that I think was, was the power of, of us having through the website and the business the data. So we could see the data coming from the back end and we could target what was needed and where things needed to be done um, in timely, very quick ways without a whole lot of bureaucracy and a whole lot of anything. We just had people that were willing to do stuff. 
the business paid the wages for the charity, so all of the, the money that we also got donated from around the world uh, went straight back out to the communities. And I think we put about $400,000 ultimately back into the communities, and that wasn't even what we set up to do. Uh, what we set up to do was to help people, um, but we had a vehicle as well to actually directly help people financially when we needed to. I'm speaking with Councillor Dion Swiggs, but you're just looking back over his... Um over his career, actually, leading up to the time when he was elected city councillor. You were really busy on the likes of CTV and probably, you know, local radio yeah. stations and what have you. Um, did you use that um, or utilise, really, that um, awareness that you had to get elected to maybe a, a community board to begin with? Uh, no, so I didn't actually get elected to a community board to start with. I just went straight. Well, I was. I didn't. Politics has never been something I've. I've, I've thought I'm going to end up being a politician. Um, but the more I poked from the side and and got things done, the more people would say to me, "Maybe you should actually step up and put your put your mouth where you, or put your money where your not your money where your mouth is, but actually walk your talk kind of thing and actually." Mm -hmm make the decisions and, and do those kind of things and the opportunity came up in the 2016 election and I was like it was there was a crucial time where I was either do I keep being the guy on the side that can push and get things done and advocate um, from the side or do I take that side step and reinvent myself and actually be that politician person and I decided to put my name forward got elected and it's been quite a learning experience um, I must say uh, the first year was just like wow actually it's really difficult to get things done but once I realized that actually the power of being elected is actually enabling and, and opening doors for other people to get things done um, it's been it's been really rewarding since so goodness me you jumped straight in now I don't think we've mentioned it yet but while all this is going on You've studied at an MBA and uh, completed it. Yes, um, yeah. So while all this was going on, I did two degrees um, after the earthquake. So military doesn't give you necessarily any qualifications that aren't, aren't outside of the military framework. And I, I <laughs> actually, it's a funny story. I applied for a job at the city council uh, in 2013. Um, in the uh, just there was a job came up and somebody said oh you should apply for that maybe and I applied for it because it was, it, there was a little a lot of uncertainty in what I was doing and it was a part time role and they said no you don't you're not going to get it because you don't have a qualification well I lost it I was like what I have all the experience and they told me that actually you're the, probably the best person that applied but we don't you don't have that qualification so I went and got a qualification then got another one uh, got another one and then um, in 2016 I started a master's in finance um, and just after I started it my dad passed away um, quite suddenly uh, so I put it on hold and then I restarted it and then I did the elections so I put it on hold after the elections and then um, and then a year later after I was elected I finally finished off the thesis so that I could actually get qualified and it was it was a very um, a, a, you know quite a very rewarding thing to do because it was quite relevant the finance side of the master in business was has helped me uh, especially understanding the uh, the finances of the city were you learning by distance or going to classes locally at the college how did that work out no, I was I was doing a distance from Adelaide University. I, I actually went around um, the local universities uh, to start with because I wanted to I wanted to I wanted to do a master's in business, but I wanted to do it with a finance uh, finance endorsement um, after it because uh, you know finance is something that I didn't know a lot about and I wanted to learn more. But I wanted to turn finance on its head and actually look at finance from a social enterprise model uh, that your shareholders are actually the customers and your your people who put money in are not the ultimate shareholders. They're the ones that actually get capitalised at the end of doing the right thing by the shareholders, which is the community around the business. Um, anyway, that's a long, long story. And I wanted to, I wanted to focus my whole masters around that concept and nobody in New Zealand would let me do it that way when I rung up Adelaide University and said I've got this idea about how I want to do it they would like open arms offer me a $10,000 scholarship and I was like sweet ass when do I sign up and uh, so yeah I was doing it um, distance I did have to go to Adelaide University three times um, but it was really good they, they were very very helpful and um, in technology these days closes gaps you don't have to be in the same place that you're actually learning. Did you maintain a similar level of confidence throughout that 
you hadn't bitten off too much and you you were going to complete this yeah you have to complete it I'm, I'm the type of person that i'll bite off a lot but i will always finish everything that i start and it's just a matter of prioritizing and uh and going when am i going to do it when i'm going to find time for myself um the one thing that i'd probably sacrifice uh personally is is, is me and friends and family time um but that's something that over time I'm I'm just getting better at doing um, and not biting off too much. But I love studying and I love learning, so I, I've always found time to be able to just get the books out and learn a little bit more here and there and whatnot. Um, but ultimately my job or my role at the moment is number one and that always takes a priority, <laughs> so, and it's quite a big role. <laughs> now we're very pleased to have um, Councillor Dion Swiggs with us this evening. He'll be with us for just a few more minutes now. Um, I'd just like to have a little discussion about your time in the Navy. When did you think mm. that you'd like to, a sort of life on the ocean wave and maybe get a commission? At what age were you? It was it was when I did the blue light course um, with the army, and it, that's under the same umbrella as LSV. It's the Youth Development Unit at uh, Burnham. Um, so I did the blue light, and it was a situation. It was a leadership course for um, I think I was fourteen at the time, and I went along there and I met some of the army guys, and we talked about military. And I was like, actually, I really want to go into the military. Um, and I had. I had people I know, I knew from the, my family that had been in the Navy, and I tossed up whether I wanted to go into the Air Force or the um, Navy, and it really came down to the what what career path did I want to sort of take, and where did where did I think um, my my life would end. Um, and really, at that age of sixteen, seventeen, you don't really know. Um, but I, I made the decision to join the Navy. Um, joined the Navy at seventeen and um, stayed there for uh, nearly four or five years and, and got commissioned. Um, I went straight in as an officer, uh, so I got commissioned um, at, at the age of, you yeah, just turned 18 at the stage when I was commissioned and um, and became executive officer on um, Hinao, which is one of the little runabout boats that have now been decommissioned. Um, did a lot of time on Tamana, which is one of our warships, and uh, spent a lot of time training as well, a lot of um, navigation training, warfare-type training, uh, leadership training, psychological training, and understanding how people react in warfare and other pressure-type situations. Right, well, thank you very much, Dion, for joining us this evening.